testing good we're on so good to be with you this morning and you could probably tell that we're doing things just a little differently today um, our service is going to be uh, different than usual um, we're going to be doing a special service which is really a reenactment of what happened on the evening before Jesus was crucified so we're going to be going back to Thursday evening on the week of Jesus' crucifixion, and we're going to be understanding better what happened between Jesus and his disciples, and he uh, had this moment with the disciples in a place we call the upper room, and uh, some things happened that evening, and after Jesus uh, had a supper with his disciples, he said, the words that are right here on this table, this do in remembrance of me. So some things happened that evening that we are going to reenact for the purpose of remembering. There's a, a purpose of teaching and calling to mind so that we can think about Jesus and what he did for us when he was crucified. So I've entitled our message as we begin this service washing dirty feet because this is actually part of what happened that evening okay so we're in the last week of jesus life here on earth and we're especially going to be looking at thursday night and we have different accounts we have matthew 26 and luke 22 and we have john 13 and we pull all of these uh, chapters together and we kind of form a picture of what happened that evening but before we get to Thursday night we're going to go back to Sunday Jesus enters Jerusalem this triumphal entry you read about it in Matthew chapter 21 verses 1 through 11 and then on Monday Jesus has a conflict with leaders in the temple he cleanses the temple of all the commercial and and uh, trafficking of money and animals that are taking place you read about it in matthew 21 verses 12 to 17. then tuesday was another day of conflict between jesus and the religious leaders of jerusalem we don't know anything about wednesday of that week none of the gospels mention anything about what happened on Wednesday but we come to Thursday and on Thursday we know that Jesus met with his disciples in a place that we call the upper room a house in Jerusalem somewhere that Jesus and his disciples reserved to come together to celebrate something that Jews celebrated every year we call it the Passover and you've heard of Passover Passover was an event that was much like what we're going to do today it was a, a reenactment of something that happened in history in order to remember the passover was uh, a ceremony a ritual in jewish culture to help god's people remember the deliverance from egypt and it wasn't just about remembering it was also about uh, seeing the future and teaching something about what god was going to do in the future through the redemption that was going to come through Jesus. And that was going to happen on Thursday night. Jesus and his disciples were going to be together in this place called the Upper Room. And they were going to have this, what we call the Last Supper, the Passover, uh, that they were going to celebrate together. And we read about it in Matthew chapter 26, verses 17 to 21. And we're not going to actually read it. Time will not allow for us to take in every detail. But suffice it to say, we have a meal that Jesus and his disciples are partaking of together in order to remember, remember what God had done in the past and the redemption that he had provided for Israel when they were serving as slaves in Egypt. And the disciples that evening didn't know exactly what to expect as they met in the upper room. Of course, Jesus knew exactly what was coming, exactly what was going to happen the next day. He was going to be betrayed and he was going to be crucified by the Romans. And uh, the disciples, they had something else on their mind. Jesus was, of course, uh, consumed with the thought of what was 
ahead for him. But the disciples that evening, they had something else in mind. We read about it in Luke chapter 22, verse 24. While Jesus is thinking about the seriousness of what Passover represented in his own life and in his own upcoming death, the Bible says that the disciples were disputing. There was a dispute among them as to which of them should be considered the greatest. So needless to say, the atmosphere that evening in the upper room where this uh, supper takes place, where they were celebrating Passover, the atmosphere was very tense. Their hearts were full of resentment towards each other. And they are at times arguing and at times just thinking negative thoughts about each other. And uh, we read in the book called Desire of Ages, a little commentary on it, on page 643, it says, The glances they cast upon each other told of jealousy and contention. The disciples were very preoccupied with hierarchy, because that's the way the Roman world and the Greek world operated, and the Jews were not immune to this way of thinking. It was a very hierarchical uh, society with... uh, uh, castes and different classes and uh, there was uh, always this idea that I want to climb that ladder. I want to be above others. And so among the disciples circle, the 12 among uh, Jesus in our group, there was always this desire to be the best, to be the greatest, to be the leader, to be the one that will not serve but be served by the rest. And so uh, whether it was stated openly or just thought, there was always this preoccupation among the disciples of who would be the greatest. That evening, as they came together for that supper, there was another cause of contention among the disciples. And the question that was on their mind, even though they weren't necessarily talking about it, was who's going to wash dirty feet. And it's hard for us to appreciate this conflict because we don't go through this today in our culture. Um, But maybe something that comes kind of close to it, caught it, uh, something that comes kind of close to it would be sitting at a table, and you've probably been through this before, at a meal, and you wonder, well, who's going to wash the dishes, right? Have you ever been through that before? Sometimes, you know, in households where men actually do dishes, I think we need to have more of those households, um, there, there can sometimes be that, you know, oh, that awkward moment where you're just sitting around and you're wondering who's going to take the initiative, stand up and actually wash the dishes. Or maybe it's a joint effort, right? It's a team effort. Well, in many cultures in the world, men don't do those kind of things, right? Just not things men do. Um, It's something that belongs to either the children or the women. We have a hard time identifying with this idea of uh, washing feet because in our culture, we drive cars and we don't wear sandals on dusty roads. But back in the time of Jesus, in the first century, Uh, Washing feet was as important and as common of a task as washing dishes or cleaning toilets or all these other things that we still do today that are necessary but unpleasant and menial, right? Um, So we need to, since we're so far removed from the culture of the first century, we need to kind of go back and have some appreciation for washing feet dirty feet. Some cultural facts about washing feet. It was customary to wash feet before eating and before going to bed. In those days, if a man had servants and, and only rich individuals owned land and had slaves, well, they would wash, the slaves would wash their master's feet. This was a mark of high achievement in society. If you could actually own property and you can own slaves and you could actually have other people wash your feet and you not have to wash others' feet, this meant that you actually achieved success in life, okay? And we all want to be successful, right? 
And so in that culture, this was a mark of success. A master would never stoop so low as to wash the feet of another person beneath him. So listen to this, everyone. Slaves washed dirty feet. Masters had their feet washed. Providing water for guests to wash their feet was a gesture of common courtesy. In general, foot washing was the work of slaves and women. Okay, So in the culture of the first century, whether it was in Jewish culture or Greek culture or Roman culture, there is a pecking order in society. There is a hierarchy. And women are always beneath men. And so a man would not wash a woman's feet, women would wash men's feet. Uh, a, a, an adult would not wash children's feet, children would wash adults' feet because in the pecking order, adult or, uh, adults are above children, right? Now, of course, we've come a long way today, haven't we? I mean, in our day and age, children eat before adults and, of course, a lot of times adults serve the children rather than the children serve the adults and of course things have changed drastically and in many ways thankfully for the better because a lot of the injustices that were uh, perpetuated in the first century are gone thankfully things have changed Um, wives back then washed the feet of their husbands and children the feet of their parents so washing another person's feet needless to say, is not a pleasant job. And that's why there's this desire among the disciples, who's going to be the greatest? That's why there's this debate, right? Because ultimately, whoever is above doesn't have to wash the toilets or wash the dishes or in the case of those times, wash the dirty feet. And everybody went to that upper room that evening, Jesus himself included, with dirty feet feet. And so there was no slave present, right? Because uh, this was not a rich group of Jewish men, Jesus and his disciples. So there's no slave, only Jesus and the disciples. And I can picture in my mind the disciples pretending not to notice that there's a pitcher over there and there's a basin and there's a towel and some water And they were hoping that someone else would take the initiative. A lot like me after a meal sometimes, right? I don't feel like washing the dishes, so I'm just waiting for someone else to take the initiative. And that's kind of what was going on. And this is what brought on this discussion. You know, who is the greatest? Who is number one in this circle of Jesus followers that we call disciples? Each one yielded to wounded pride and decided not to act the part of a slave. Now, this is profound. And so, again, in a few moments, we are going to reenact some of the things that happened that evening with Jesus and his disciples. And the purpose for reenacting is in order for us to what, everyone? Remember, right? Because remembering, sometimes, you know, you can hear a lecture And you can forget, right? I mean, how many of us in school, we hear lectures and then we don't get good grades on the test. But when we actually enact, when we actually participate, we put our hands on things, we touch, we taste, we see, we smell, it leaves a deeper impact. And this is the reason why we do what we're about to do in just a few moments as a church, okay? Um... We're going to reenact because some things happened that evening that have profound lessons that we don't want to forget, okay? There was no slave and somebody had to take initiative and wash some dirty feet. We read in Desire of Ages, page 644, all the disciples manifested a stoical unconcern, seeming unconscious that there was anything for them to do. By their silence, they refused to humble themselves. And I want us to all put ourselves in the place of those disciples. Because we all go through this. You know, we feel like it is beneath us to do certain things. 
we feel like somebody else needs to take the initiative. Somebody else needs to take that first step. So who will break the icy silence? That is the question. The disciples made no move towards serving one another. Jesus waited for a time to see what they would do. Then Jesus got up from the table, and we read in John chapter 13. This is where we find the story of Jesus washing the disciples' feet. And I just want to say a very important point here uh, before we continue. This was not a ceremony. This was like washing the dishes at your house. Washing the dishes is not a ceremony. It is a part of everyday life, right? It is a necessary part of everyday life. Cleaning toilets, vacuuming the carpet, not a ceremony. When Jesus gets up, it says Jesus rose from supper and laid aside his garments, he took a towel, and he girded himself. Jesus is not doing this ceremonially. Jesus is doing what was necessary to be done. Nobody else wanted to do it. So Jesus, whom they all acknowledged to be number one, right? They all called him master. They all acknowledged that he was the Lord. He is the one that takes the initiative and begins washing the feet of the disciples. What a rebuke to a murmuring disciple. How shocked they must have been. And I love this about Jesus because, you know, Jesus that evening could have scolded them and just publicly humiliated them for the way they were behaving and the way they were thinking. But what Jesus does that evening by washing their feet is a gentle rebuke for their pride and immaturity. Chapter 13, verse 5 of John. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel. Here's an important point. Jesus even washed Judas' feet. And I want to just consider with you for just a moment, you know, our enemies, people that may have hurt us in some way. Judas was about to do something very hurtful to Jesus. He was going to betray Jesus. He was going to turn him into the Roman authorities. Judas was being false. Jesus was, uh, Judas was being abusive in some ways. Um, and Jesus washed his feet. And Jesus takes initiative. And sometimes we can be hurt by other people. Sometimes they are minor offenses. Sometimes they are major offenses. And we have this idea that we learn from culture that whenever we are hurt, whenever somebody does something painful to us, they are the ones that have to take initiative in order for things to be better. So I wait in my corner, and until they do what they need to do to make it right, I just hate them and keep my distance from them. Well, we don't learn this from Jesus because Jesus takes initiative. Even to the one who was his betrayer, Judas, Jesus washed his feet. Then when Jesus comes to Peter, in John chapter 13, verse 6, the Bible says that Peter responds, Peter is shocked. He says, Lord, are you washing my feet? Peter was not comfortable with this because Peter knew that Jesus was above him in the pecking order. And so Peter is uncomfortable and he's shocked that, P uh, that Jesus would do such a thing. And, uh, of course, Jesus responds to Peter and uh, we read here, Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. And Peter says, Jesus says to Peter, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part in me. You know, I can imagine as, as Jesus is washing Peter's feet, the Holy Spirit is washing Peter's heart of all that resentment and all those feelings of pride, you know, and all those uh, selfish desires of being first because Jesus, the one who 
really didn't deserve to be washing anyone's feet, really didn't have to be doing it, is the one that takes the initiative and does it. So Peter obviously was regretting his previous attitude and how he wished that he were the one washing the feet of Jesus. But that would have meant washing the feet of those he was not willing to get along with. It means washing the feet of those with whom he was not on good terms. And we don't want to do that, do we? If somebody's hurt us in some way, we don't want to have to do them a favor, right? We don't want to treat them kindly because that would somehow acknowledge that what they did to us was right, right? Wrong. Jesus washing Judas' feet was in no way an endorsement of the evil that he was doing. So don't think that if someone has hurt you and you decide by the grace of God that you're going to love them and do good to them, that you are in any way endorsing the evil that they have done. That is not true. So I want to ask you this question. Have you gone years without speaking to someone in your life? Or have you gone years harboring bitterness and resentment towards anyone in your life? Thinking that you're only going to change your attitude once they take initiative? I want to invite you to consider the example of Jesus. And I want to tell you a story. I shared this uh, with the young people in Sabbath school today. And this story, I believe, illustrates well how sometimes the offended, not the offender, needs to take initiative. Uh, these are my grandparents, and uh, they're Abigail and Caleb's great-grandparents. This is Abigail when she was a baby. And uh, about 20 years ago, Grandma found out that Grandpa had been cheating on her. And it wasn't just, you know, something that was happening in the last year. This was throughout their marriage. And you can only imagine the pain and the, the sorrow that discovering something like this would bring to a person that has been married for so long to another person. Grandma struggled for at least a good two years, and I watched it with anger and depression and shock and mourning, grieving, you know, you name it, all of those emotions. And eventually she had to make a decision. Am I going to hate this person for the rest of my life? And by hating this person, am I really helping myself? Is this really good for me? And she discovered the power of God that grants us forgiveness towards others. It's something that we can't produce on our own. It's not something that we can explain with human words. But when you begin to love and desire good towards somebody who has violated you and hurt you deeply. But you know, forgiveness doesn't always mean trust. Forgiveness doesn't even always equate to reconciliation. Often it does not. And in the case of grandma and grandpa, it did not mean that they got back together. It didn't mean that their marriage was restored. I mean, after all, grandpa was really not willing to give up his promiscuous lifestyle, but he would have loved to still have someone to wash his clothes and uh, cook his meals and take care of his house. So he was definitely willing to stay married, but you know, his life, he was still going to live. I love my grandpa, by the way, but I don't endorse the things he did. Um, but the beautiful thing about forgiveness is grandma was able to relieve, relieve herself of the hatred, of the negative feelings, to the point where they still can have a cordial relationship for the sake of the family, for the sake of the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren. She's even able to have him over for a meal uh, when we're visiting uh, and have a normal relationship to some degree. She has relieved herself. She has released him of her judgment towards him and turned it over to God because ultimately some things are out of our control. She took initiative and said, you know what? I'm going to make this relationship work not in a marriage context but at least in a friendship context so that I do not harbor this anger that is hurting me for the rest of my life. 
And uh, Jesus said something in Matthew chapter 5, verse 24, that explains the importance of making that decision. He said, first be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. There's something about anger and resentment harbored in our hearts towards others that affects our relationship with God. Jesus was not saying that I don't want you to come to me until you've gotten it all right. But what he's saying here is that until you have made a decision to release your brother or sister from the anger that you feel towards them, your relationship, your prayer life, your worship will be affected. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, Peter understood this as well when he said, You husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way so that your prayers will not be hindered. You know, have you ever tried praying and having a relationship with God when you're still harboring hatred in your heart? This is no reflection on God. God is not a God that wants you to get everything right in order for you to come to Him. As a matter of fact, you have to come to Him with the anger and with the negative feelings in order for Him to help you process those. But the truth is, if you choose to harbor and if you choose to hold on to those feelings of hatred, your prayer life will be hindered. There is a barrier that you will create between you and God when you harbor hatred towards other human beings. You cannot, John says in 1 John, love God whom you have not seen if you hate people in your life. Alienation. You know, the path to alienation is an easy one. It goes something like this. Somebody hurts you and you're angry with that person. Then you withdraw and tell other people about the pain the person has caused you. Most of us are non-confrontationists, meaning that when we are hurt, we prefer not having a conversation with the person that hurt us or offended us. We notice that the relationship has been strained and we just withdraw. We don't want to talk about it with the person. The person involved is the last person in the world we want to have that conversation with. So we find outlets with others. We like to vent with others about our negative feelings towards people in our lives who may have been hurtful. Then three, we expect the person to know they are wrong and come to us, right? We want them to take the initiative. We want them to know exactly what it was that was done. We assume that they know. And then we overcompensate to make things right without specifically addressing the issue. This may not be the case for all of us, but in general, at least as I'm analyzing my own relationships in the past, this is my tendency. If the shoe fits, wear it. Romans chapter 12, verse 18. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. The key words here are as much as depends on you, as much as is possible. It highlights two points. The other party has to be willing to be reconciled, and you must not rest until you have done ep absolutely everything in your power to reconcile. So what is my part if someone has hurt me? Reconciliation takes two parties. With my grandmother, reconciliation could not be possible because grandpa still wanted to live his promiscuous life. But what was her part? Forgiveness. Releasing him of her judgment. Turning over to God the negative feelings, the bitterness, the resentment. And that's our part when we are hurt. And what Jesus does is his part when he takes the initiative to go and wash the disciples' feet. For the other 11 had a cleansing effect. For Judas, it just drove him deeper into his darkness. The love of God will either lead us to repentance or it can, in some cases, harden us. 
In our relationship with others, we must do what Jesus did with the disciples. Take the initiative. Do everything that is within our reach, our power to have healthy relationships with others. So I'm inviting you today, as we go through this ceremony, if there is an unhealthy relationship in your life right now, search your heart and ask yourself the question, have I done everything on my part? The path to reconciliation is a little more messy, a little more difficult than the path to alienation. You want to have reconciliation, whether you are the offended or the offender, genuinely try to understand how the other person feels. You know, one thing I've learned about people, especially people that I've hated, is if I only knew a little more of the context of their story, I would be more generous towards them. You, know, you think about the whole life of a person, their childhood, maybe the abuse they experienced, and now they're abusive. And yes, there's no excuse for abuse and bad behavior, but let me tell you, if we saw their whole lives the way God sees it, we would be so much more generous. And we would understand better why God is so generous even to the unjust. Genuinely try to understand the other person and then release the person from your judgment. Specifically acknowledge where you have done wrong if you are the offender. And that may be a small offense between you and your spouse or children or brother, sister, coworker. You know, one thing that I've also discovered, we are really, really poor at apologizing. You know, apologizing is an, a skill. A good apology is never vague. It's never conditional. You know, you want to know what a bad apology looks like? You know, honey, if I did anything to hurt you yesterday, please forgive me. That's a terrible apology. It just completely skirts the issue. It takes no responsibility. It adds that word if, which kind of just justifies, you know. I'm sorry you feel that way. I'm not the problem. You're the problem because you feel that way, right? If that's the way you apologize, then we need to reconsider what a good apology looks like. You know, the Bible has some great, great, uh, lessons about good confession. That, that's what an apology is, is a confession. You know, confession is always specific. It never seeks to defend oneself. It is always going to be accompanied by change in attitude and behavior. Specifically acknowledge where you have done wrong and agree to respectfully disagree if differences of opinion remain. These are just a few important lessons about reconciliation. Why do we call this communion? Does anybody know where that word comes from? You know, we call it communion. We don't even know what we're talking about sometimes. It comes from a Greek word called koinonia. And, uh, you know, we have this English word that we also use for it. It's called fellowship, and it's communion, and it's unity, and there's so many English words we can bring together to try to express this idea, of this Greek word called koinonia. And koinonia is what happens between family members. It's intimacy. It's transparency. It's authenticity. And so we, we call it communion because that's exactly what Jesus desired would exist between his disciples. His last prayer recorded in the Gospels is John 17. And the word that comes up over and over again is unity. And the thing that breaks Jesus' heart more than anything else is when his family is dysfunctionally fighting with each other and harboring negative feelings towards one another. John 13, verse 12. So when he had washed their feet taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? 
Jesus is inviting them to reflect on what just happened. And today we're going to reflect on what he did. The issue was much deeper than the washing of dirty feet. Jesus was trying to cleanse them from pride, selfishness, resentment, and even hatred for one another. While they were contending for the highest place, he to whom every knee shall bow, he whom the angels of glory counted honor to serve, bowed down to wash the feet of those who called him Lord. So what would happen if Christians follow Jesus' example? I'm not talking about the ceremony. The ceremony is easy to do, okay? We could do the ceremony with a lot of hatred in our hearts we can smile and say happy sabbath to each other and the heart is just full of poison but what would happen if the substance to which the shadow points us to actually became a reality in our lives it would look like what paul says in philippians 2 2 fulfill my joy being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. John 13, 14. If I then, Jesus says, as after he's done, he says, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Okay, I have to say this before we dismiss. Often we read this passage and we take it as a command to participate in the ceremony. And I'm going to say this to you today. Jesus was not commanding his church to participate in the foot washing ceremony. Okay? Now we do it. I think it's great that we do it. I'm all for it because the more visual, the more hands-on we can make the lessons of the gospel the better. The deeper the lessons will sink into our hearts. But listen to me. When Jesus says, you also ought to wash one another's feet, he was not commanding a ceremony. He was saying, you need to serve one another the way I served you. So when I read this passage, if I read it right, this has more to do with me washing the dishes and vacuuming the floor at home than it does with ceremony. The ceremony, Paul says, is a shadow. And shadows are good, but the substance is better. Okay? Now you understand the difference between shadow and substance, right? Wally, come here for a second. I'm sorry. I didn't tell you I was going to do this. Can you all see there's a shadow over there of Wally? See that? If you don't see it, because you're sitting too far away, imagine. There's shadow here. This is Wally. This is substance. Now, if I haven't seen Wally in a long time, and I'm going to embrace Wally, I'm not going to embrace his shadow. Now, his shadow can have, you know, meaning. Thank you, Wally. I appreciate it. I won't embrace you right now. The, sh the, the shadow can have meaning. You know, if you haven't seen somebody in a long time, and you have a picture of them, the picture has a great deal of meaning. And a shadow is good, but the substance is better. Okay? What we're about to do is we are going to participate in shadow, a teaching device. There's nothing sacramental. There's no value in it in and of itself. It is simply a shadow that points to a reality. So I can wash my wife's feet... But at home, I can live selfishly. And I can be obsessed with the shadow, and the substance is not there. And Paul says, God prefers substance rather than shadow. Now, shadows have their place, but they can't be a substitute for substance. Are you following me? So, in other words, washing another person's feet today is simply a ceremony that is designed to impress a deeper lesson in our minds about the gospel, about Jesus, about his character, okay? Jesus, Lord of heaven and earth, 
gave himself for those who did not deserve it. That's substance, right? And in my life, that has to translate into how I treat other people. So if during the week I am a terrible person and I live selfishly for myself at home, at work, and everywhere else, but the shadow, as if the shadow is going to save me, that's not what God intended. So when Jesus says, I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Replace that with something like, you also ought to wash the dishes, or you also ought to clean the toilets. I'm giving you examples. You fill in the blank. You know what it is. The thing that you feel you don't have to do for that person because they're the ones that should do it for you. Think about that as you participate in it. At this time, I'm going to dismiss us. And I want to say, you know, you're welcome to join, but you're also welcome to stay here. We're going to actually go and we're going to go wash feet. Okay, we're going to go wash some not so dirty feet. They're not as dirty as they used to be back in the first century. But um, I want you to, um, if you do decide to participate, the men are going to be in a classroom to the left. You just follow the flux, follow the flow with